Hey guys, today in class we took a look at the trends of atomic radius, ionic radius, and electronegativity. There's still two more trends that we need to attend to, that of ionization energy and electron affinity. Uh, let's kick things off with ionization energy. Ionization energy is defined as the minimum amount of energy that's required to remove an electron from a gaseous atom in its ground state. Okay. The idea here is that by working with gaseous atoms, we limit things like intermolecular forces, which could otherwise throw kind of a kink in our calculations. So if we have some element X that's in the gaseous state and we supply sufficient energy, we can ionize uh, that gas. We can ionize that element. And doing so by stripping away an electron, uh, we create the positive cation there. Okay, Let's jump right into trends. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is... Uh, what happens as we move across the periodic table, okay? Um, as we move to the right on the periodic table, we're going to find that ionization energy increases. And so what I have here is just the second uh, period, right? Lithium all the way through neon. And what I've written out there are the atomic numbers, right? The, the nuclear charges. And so as we progress from left to right on the periodic table, we find that nuclear charge is increasing, right? So that positive attractive pull of the nucleus is really kind of bearing down on the electrons in the electron cloud, okay? You know, as we move left to right on the periodic table, sure, you know, electrons are being added to the same energy level. However, if you're starting to think, okay, what about shielding? Well, core electrons do a really nice job of shielding valence electrons, okay, undeniably. That being said, valence electrons don't do a great job of shielding each other. They do, uh, but not to some you know, grand scale, okay? So essentially, as we move from left to right on the periodic table, this increasing nuclear charge is gonna make it harder and harder and harder to remove an electron, thereby increasing ionization energy. Uh, this equation here may or may not seem familiar. This is Coulomb's law, or the uh, Columbic attractive force. It's kind of the equation governing the electromagnetic or the electrostatic force. Um, so what we're kind of talking about is Q1 is really just representing a charge, right? So maybe it's the, um, you know, all the positive charges that we're talking about, so the, the nuclear charge. Uh, Q2 is going to represent maybe the electron that we're looking to remove. Uh, K is a constant. Uh, we just call it the columbic constant. Uh, it happens to be 8.9875 times by 10 to the 9th Newton meter squared per coulomb squared. Um, we're not going to have to worry about that simply because we're going to use the columbic uh, equation, Coulomb's force equation, really just in a qualitative way, not a quantitative way. Okay, um, So it not only takes into account the strength of these charges, uh, the higher the charge, obviously, because it's in the numerator here, we'd be increasing the force of attraction, but also takes into account the distance. So the greater the distance between ions, uh, or charged particles, I should say, we're going to find that the columbic attractive force is actually diminished. Okay. Uh, let's examine this idea of nuclear charge in a little bit more depth. Okay. Rather than strictly talking about nuclear charge, we can actually talk about what's called the effect effective nuclear charge. And the idea with effective nuclear charge is that it's really uh, the nuclear charge that's felt by an electron when both the actual nuclear charge, so again just the sum of protons, is taken into account, but also we take into account the repulsive effects of shielding. So again, this is mostly talking about core electrons, but we're going to see in a second that valence electrons do, to some degree, shield other valence electrons. So let's take a look at this model of lithium. You might think that, hey, you know, this electron can cancel out with a proton, this electron can cancel out with a proton, and what we're finding is that this electron is really kind of only feeling an effective nuclear charge of plus one, right? Possibly, so I'm gonna write one proton question mark. Um, we find that experimentally, uh, or maybe mathematically rather, that the effective nuclear charge is actually 1.28. Okay, so this single electron, in order to pluck it off of the atom, to ionize it here, uh, is feeling kind of an attractive pull of positive 1.28. So these, you know, these inner core electrons do, to some degree, negate 
those protons in the nucleus, uh, but not entirely. Okay, it's feeling a little bit more than just a plus one here. It's actually about a 1.28. Okay, so again, we see that core electrons do a nice job of shielding uh, those outer electrons from the full uh, force, the full attractive force of the inner core electrons, or the inner core protons there, I should say. Uh, let's take a look at fluorine for a second. Um, again, kind of thinking about this effective nuclear charge, let's say that these two core electrons can cancel out with these two protons in the nucleus. Well, now it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It looks like maybe this electron right here is feeling the pull of seven protons, okay? Um, and we find that's actually not quite right. We're actually about an effective nuclear charge. Again, we're Z. Normally we use for like atomic number, the number of protons, but the effective nuclear charge or Z sub F is equal to 5.1. It's less than our predicted seven. So clearly, these valence electrons, the electrons that are in the exact same energy level, are to some degree shielding this other valence electron, okay? It's not with the full kind of like one, two, three, four, five, six, where six electrons are canceling out six protons. Uh, they don't quite do that, uh, but they do have some effect for sure, okay? So again, valence electrons can shield other valence electrons, just not to the same extent that core electrons can. Okay, let's push on and talk about the trend as we work down the periodic table, which I think is a little bit easier to digest here. Okay, um, the ionization energy is definitely going to decrease as we go down. Okay, and this is why. Uh, the effective nuclear charge is increasing. Sure, absolutely, okay. However, as we move down, this electron, again, the one that we are actually trying to remove, the one you know, that's requiring energy to pluck off, uh, this is getting so much further away from the nucleus, right? N, uh, that quantum number, is increasing all the way from, what is this, uh, two down to four, okay? Um, so as we increase as we increase D in that denominator of the uh, Coulomb, uh, Coulomb's law, we're gonna find that as the denominator increases, subsequently the attractive force is going to decrease, okay? Um, the other thing we find is that we're definitely gonna have some shielding effects, like for sure, okay? Um, all of these inner core electrons here Right, are definitely going to have a repulsive effect on that outside valence electrons. And as it becomes easier to remove this electron right here, we would say that the ionization energy is going to decrease. Okay, So there's kind of this interplay between, yes, all right, effective nuclear charge is increasing, great. However, we're getting pretty far away from the nucleus. And given that that term in the denominator is squared, uh, that's going to have a pretty uh, substantial effect there. Okay. Now we talk about trends because there are at times exceptions, okay? There are two kind of noti uh, notable exceptions that I would like to discuss. So two exceptions of note. Um, so again, we just got done saying that as we move to the right on the periodic table, we're gonna find that the ionization energy increases. And so we see that, right? Lithium to beryllium, we go from 520 kJ per mole to 899 kJ per mole. We slide over, we go to boron, we go from 899 up to 801. Wait, not up to 801, we actually went down to 801. So clearly there is something going on here, okay? Um, the idea here is that we've just added this next valence electron into a 2p uh, type energy level and subshell, okay? And as we've done that, this electron is actually further away from the nucleus than say this electron. Again, we're making a comparison between trying to remove this one and perhaps this one. So if this is further away from the nucleus, so again, if the distance increases here, we're gonna see that the force goes down. So that's one key component here, okay? That that 2p electron is further from the nucleus, okay? The other thing that we kinda need to consider here is that this electron is now also being shielded by the other valence electrons. This 2p1 electron right here is actually being shielded by two electrons within that S sublevel. And so the second thing that we need to kind of concern ourselves with is that 
that 2p electron is shielded from the nucleus by the 2s electrons. Okay, so two things going on, but then we're right back to business, right? We go from five to six, we have this increasing nuclear charge, and as a result, uh, we're gonna find that we kind of continue that trend and we see this ever increasing ionization energy as we slide left to right on the periodic table, okay? Uh, the other exception that I'd like to share with you guys um, involves going from nitrogen to oxygen, okay? Again, kind of a little peculiar here. Um, we go from an ionization energy, say of trying to remove this electron at about 1400 kJ per mole, and then we go down to 1314, right? As maybe we try to remove this electron right here, okay? The reason behind this is because this electron, as we try to remove it, is experiencing repulsive forces with the uh, other electron that's right there. Right, so the other one that's an opposite in spin within that exact same type of p orbital, maybe it's the px, py, pz, we don't know, uh, it's getting kind of an extra little boost, right? As we want to remove it, it's already experiencing repulsive effects. And so subsequently, it makes this circled electron in red here a little bit easier to remove. Again, because it's already being repelled by this electron that's pointed to with that black arrow, okay? But again, just as we saw that other exception, we kind of continue on the periodic table, we get back to this ever increasing nuclear charge, and all of a sudden, we see this trend continue on. Okay, so we do have these deviations in the trend, but normally they can be explained with just kind of a simple orbital diagram. So now that we've covered this idea of uh, ionization energy, we're gonna get into the concept of uh, second and third ionization energies. So what if we've removed an electron Right, as we've just studied here. And now we're gonna take the ion that's currently existing and remove yet another electron to produce, say, the plus two ion. Uh, we take it one step further, that plus two goes to plus three. Can we talk about the energies of these successive electron uh, kind of removals? And we can. Uh, the trend holds up really well. We're gonna find that the second and third ionization energies are always, always, always greater um, than say the first. So it is progressive. By the time we try to go to remove more and more electrons, it becomes increasingly difficult, okay? So as an example, in the neutral atom, we find that protons are equivalent to electrons. But every time we remove an electron, because the number of protons is now outweighing the number of electrons, we find that we are essentially increasing the effective nuclear charge, okay? There's less electrons that we have to attend to uh, as far as like that, you know, that charge being kind of distributed about, okay? There's less electrons that can cancel out the protons, uh, as we saw in that lithium and fluorine example. Um, there's also going to be less shielding, okay? So all these things kind of combined, as we continue to progress from the neutral to the plus one to the plus two, we're going to find that the effective nuclear charge increases because, again, protons starts to outweigh electrons, okay? Um... And then again, we're also reducing the amount of shielding, and that kind of ties into the effective nuclear charge uh, increasing, okay? As the effective nuclear charge increases, we find that there's gonna be a greater attractive force between the nucleus and the outermost electrons that we're trying to remove, and if it's harder, right? If it's harder to remove an electron because of the greater attractive force, we see that it requires a higher ionization energy, okay? Uh, I think an example with magnesium is really going to help firm this up. Uh, let's take a little look here. Um, so what I have are four orbital diagrams. Okay, so let's, I guess, start at the top. Um, let's say we have magnesium, and we want to remove just a single electron. So we want to make an Mg1+. Uh, that requires a fair amount of energy here, right? Um, I mean, I don't know, we're trying to remove maybe this electron, it's kind of far away from the nucleus, has a little bit of repulsive effects with the electron that's already in that uh, S subshell, uh, but it's not too bad. So 738. Well, once we have the magnesium one plus in hand, and I wanna remove now this electron to form Mg2 plus, we find that that actually requires a fair amount of energy. And this is not like, it, it's not like uh, it's an additional 700. It is an additional 1450. It's not the difference. It is a brand new 
1450 here, okay? Um, and the reason behind that, again, we have this increasing effective nuclear charge right? We talked about in class today the idea that whenever we have an ion, particularly for cations, uh, we're going to say that the ionic radius for cations are, or maybe is, uh, smaller than the neutral atom, okay? And again, per Coulomb's law, if ever the atomic radius is smaller, um, we're going to find that that denominator, that d squared term, um, is, is going to uh, become less, okay? Uh, and it's that decreasing distance that's actually going to create a larger columbic force, okay? And let's just actually map that really quick. So right here, if we're just monitoring this, let's call this D1, okay? Well, now all of a sudden, per my diagram, we're going to see that this is D2, which is clearly less as depicted than D1. Okay, and again, the reason this is important, and we'll come back to this in a second, is because if we are decreasing the distance, this term becomes smaller. If this term becomes smaller, we find there's an increase in that columbic attractive force requiring more and more energy to remove it. We call that energy the ionization energy, okay? Um, so again, uh, effective nuclear charge is increasing, so we're going to see this term maybe start to go up. Uh, we're also going to see this distance start to decrease. Again, both of these lead to a larger columbic force. So, okay, you know, we've supplied 1450 kilojoules per mole uh, worth of atoms, which is attending to that many, you know, one mole worth of electrons. Um, and we arrive in this scenario where now we have no more valence electrons in that 3s kind of energy level and sublevel there, our valence electrons are truly residing in that 2p area. Well, now, if I want to remove an electron from Mg2+, where now, again, the effective nuclear charge is really high, right? We have this disproportionate ratio of protons to electrons at this point. Not only do we have this increasing effective nuclear charge, I'm removing an electron in the second energy level. Formerly, we're up in the third. Now we're all the way down in the second energy level. Like this distance, let's call this D3, this is even smaller than D2, right? So we are really uh, driving down uh, our denominator here. And again, when we drive down the denominator, this force is becoming larger and larger and larger. So if I'm talking about removing that electron right there, well, holy smokes, I just said holy smokes, that's embarrassing. Uh, look at how high this jumps. It goes from 1450 all the way up to 7730. That's insane. That's huge, okay? This is a crazy, holy smoke type amount, okay? Um, so again, as we continue on, at some point we see that it's not only progressive, 738 to 1450, we're going to hit this area where because we've gotten to essentially what was a core electron, this value just bumps way the heck up there. Okay, so again, just to kind of summarize here, to go from Mg2 plus to Mg3 plus, we had to remove what was previously a core electron, right? Which means it was that much closer to the nucleus, the distance is that much less, the attractive force is that much greater, which we gotta you know, supply a whole bunch of energy to strip that electron away, okay? Um, just to kind of summarize, uh, when it comes to ionization energy, we're gonna see an increase largely for two reasons. Okay, uh, one, maybe we're trying to remove an electron that is closer to the nucleus, right? The positive attractive pull of the nucleus. The other thing we may find is that we're trying to remove an electron from an ion with more overall positive charge, right? Uh, uh, effectively, we have a larger nuclear charge. And though we didn't work it, you know, you can reference the text. I think it'd be valuable to maybe take a look at you know, what's going on between aluminum plus one and aluminum plus two. We haven't reached a core electron quite yet, but we're still gonna see a pretty significant jump in going from say aluminum to aluminum one plus, and then going from aluminum one plus to aluminum two plus, okay? The last thing I'd ask you to consider, and again, this diagram uh, you'll receive from me in class, we will also see it in the book, is what I've done here is I've circled uh, these kind of crazy amounts. 
right? Like we see, okay, you know, we're increasing as we continue to ionize these things. But at some point we hit this threshold where these numbers just absolutely skyrocket. All of these circled numbers right here represent the ionization energy that is at that point required to remove an electron that was previously a core electron, right? So what we've done is we've taken N, the, the quantum number for energy level, and we reduced it by one. Again, we get closer to the nucleus. It's that much more tightly bound. It is that much harder to remove. So we see these just, you know, crazy jumps at some point dependent on the element and its electron configuration. All right. Thanks, guys.